Hello, I am Dr. Troy Smith, and this is Environmental History. What, you may be asking yourself, is environmental history? This. Uh, but to uh, have a more, more precise definition, um, because I asked myself that same question when I signed up for my first environmental history class in uh, grad school. Uh, first, I should specify this is U.S. environmental history. It's not world environmental history, and that makes a difference. But probably the best definition for environmental history is a history of human interaction with their physical surroundings. Now, looking at it that way, there's an element in, well, sometimes stronger, sometimes less, but there's an element of environmental history in just about any kind of history that you can talk about because the, the environment is uh, obviously a big part of the story. Now, in addition to being a uh, history professor, I also write fiction. I'm a novelist and I used to, uh, uh, for five or six years, I taught a writer's workshop about the fundamentals of writing fiction. And I'm going to hearken back to that for a moment. The, the sort of the three pillars on which a good story rests are uh, plot, characters, and setting. And in some stories or some types of stories, the setting is so important that it's almost like one of the characters. Now think, for example, of um, um, anything by Jack London during the, uh, you know, the, the Yukon Gold Rush in the Klondike up in, up in Alaska. The setting is almost one of the characters. Most, uh, most Western stories. Um, if you've ever seen the uh, Tom Hanks movie Castaway, where he's, a stra where he's stranded on an island, the environment is the only other character besides him, basically, in the story. And we're going to be honing in, in this class, on, I guess you could say, setting as a character. A character in the story, in the unfolding narrative of U.S. history. How are we going to do that? Well, come along for the ride and you'll find out, but I will, I will lay out for you kind of the structure of this course. It's really going to be in two parts and hey there's going to be a midterm right in the middle of those two parts the first part is essentially a history of american attitudes toward nature attitudes and interactions toward nature when i say americans i we go back you know, past 1776, and we talk about the colonists, the European colonists, but we also talk about the Americans who were here first, the Native American, American Indians. Uh, the second half of the course is then going to get very specific, picking up in the late 1800s and uh, become a history of what today we call the environmental movement starting off with conservationism and preservationism which are two separate but similar things and we'll kind of we'll kind of go through go through that that history and toward the end we will wind up by looking at some some unique challenges to the United States where the environment is concerned in the 21st century all right well over the course particularly of the first half as we're looking at attitudes toward nature, we're going to be looking uh, much less at science and much more not just at history, but also in various ways to various degrees uh, to looking at art and literature, um, some, some, some poetry. We're going to be looking at some philosophy. We're going to be looking at some... Um, religious frameworks, all those different things that come together to make a culture what it is. Because I would argue 
and I bet without even having taken these classes yet, you would agree with me, Americans have developed a very unique culture where the environment is concerned. Um, American interaction with the environment in the United States is similar to everywhere else, but very unique, very different from most places as well. So how did that happen? How did it get to be that way? Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Is it a mixture of the two? How can we try to mitigate any of the bad effects if indeed it is a bad thing? Those are the questions that we're going to grapple with over the course of this class. First, we're going to look at the philosophical foundations of American views toward nature. And by that, I don't just mean the viewpoints that European colonists had when they first arrived in the New World that would develop into quote-unquote American views. But I'm talking about where did those views come from? How did they develop? How did those Europeans of the 16th, 17th century uh, wind up with the views that they had. And for that, we have to go way back before 1776. We have to go back to the development of Western civilization or Western culture. And what is Western culture, if not kind of a blending of the culture of classical Greece and Rome from two or three thousand years ago with the religious and cultural beliefs that were uh, that were prevalent in the Middle East particularly Israel two or three thousand years ago when you take those two things and mix them together you have medieval Christendom or as uh, in the mid 20th century people started referring to it the Judeo Christian tradition. So um, that's, that's how Europeans wound up having the attitudes that they did by the time of the Middle Ages, the Renaissance. All right, so what are those attitudes? Well, they include the idea that humanity and nature are two separate things. Humanity is not part of nature. They're separate, and nature or the environment is subordinate to humans and to human needs. And from that, that framework, in that context, then Western history is framed as humanity's long struggle with the natural world and gradual domination of it. Uh, this is what was called progress. Progress means change. And it means good, positive change. And in, again, that context, from that viewpoint, good, positive change is change that puts humans ever more securely in power over nature. Now, there were other cultures that had beliefs similar to this, but not all cultures did. And we will be looking uh, at some of the cultures that that did not. So this is not kind of a uh, general human nature approach uh, that everybody winds up having, uh, that everyone winds up developing. It was very uh, specific and unique, sort of as a result of the, uh, the spread of Christianity uh, during the early Roman Empire and the adoption of it and how some of those Middle Eastern concepts translated into uh, European uh, perceptions of them. So uh, let's just uh, take a look at some of those Judeo-Christian traditions. So you weren't expecting this on day one of environmental history, but I'm fixing to read some scripture at you. All right, all this is from Genesis, just some selected passages that might be familiar to you. All right, um, here we have, uh, beginning with uh, accompanying this famous, famous uh, picture from the Sistine Chapel. And God said, 
Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Well, right there, you've got uh, a couple of a couple of things that are that are important to understand. Number one, that uh, God said, uh, "Let's create humans and let's put them in charge over all the natural things, over all the animals, over all the uh, uh, cattle, over all the snakes, over all the fish, everything." And He also said that that humans are created in the divine image that humans are like God. And then, you know, after, after humans had been created in the, uh, the biblical story in Genesis, Adam and Eve, God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So, the basic command given to humans by the Creator was make more humans, uh, make a bunch of humans, and subdue everything, and dominate everything. Now, before we go further, just think about how this this philosophy, this approach, would, uh, would have an effect as opposed to other traditions, other approaches that say humans are part of nature as though nature were a big web and all has to interact together. Now this is saying humans are in charge, God put them there, and they're supposed to dominate everything. Well, as you probably know from Sunday school, Adam and Eve didn't do so well. Uh, and uh, God got mad at them, and then um, said, as he cast them out of the garden, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So he cast them out of paradise. What is, what is paradise? Um, what was the garden of Eden? That doesn't necessarily mean like a vegetable garden. Um, Think of, if you're familiar with, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon in the ancient world. It's like, uh, it's like a well-manicured park where you can enjoy nature, um, but although it might feel natural, it has been shaped by human hands and it is orderly, right? So to be cast out of that, out of paradise, the opposite of paradise where Adam and Eve were sent, out there in the wide world where things are not orderly. Things are chaotic and humans do not have it under control and it's going to be hard. This is what God is saying. You're going to have to work out in the fields and you're going to have to sweat and you're going to have a rough time and you're going to have to deal with thorns and thistles and life's just going to be rough. That is not paradise. But still, the... Uh, the charge essentially is, the order given to them is, even though it's a lot harder, you still got to go out there and dominate it. You still got to get it under control. And that's what will make it a paradise as opposed to a wilderness or a desert. And we'll be talking more about those concepts later. Well, as the book of Genesis goes on, humans mess up some more. And so God sends a flood and he kills everybody except for one family. Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives. And so this is kind of like Adam and Eve starting all over again. And once they uh, disembark from the ark, maybe they disembarked, uh, God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful 
and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. So now, animals are going to be scared of you, uh, because they know they need to be, because you're, uh, you're coming to get them, to eat them, uh, and to control and dominate them. Okay? Now, this... This, this was really like, you know, a foundational document, as you know, not just of a religion, but of a culture, of many cultures. And it's obviously a, a contributor to, to the, uh, the attitude that humans are above nature, because humans are more like God. They're not like the natural world. And like God, they need to keep order and they need to control Things. Now, I've hinted that not all cultures looked at things that way. For example, even the Europeans. This is how the Europeans had come to look at things by the Middle Ages. But um, Europeans in Western and Northern Europe, before they converted to Christianity, when they had their, uh, their own uh, native religions that... Uh, would be referred to by Christians as pagan in a pejorative manner, tended to be much closer to nature. Whether you're talking about um, folks like this, and these look like reenactors, uh, but I think they actually are modern-day uh, pagans. But this is the kind of, uh, kind of folks that were in the British Isles, for example, a couple of thousand years ago. Uh, so, um, Druids... Um, Celtic, Pictish, um, Germanic uh, on the uh, European mainland 1,500 years ago, um, and other cultures around the country as, or around the world as well. Cultures that the quote-unquote modern uh, Europeans who were the, uh, uh, at the apex in their own opinion of progress cultures that they would have looked down on as primitive and overly simplistic uh, tended to be much closer to nature, right? That they tended to believe that uh, they were not in charge. Actually, nature was in charge. And you've got to interact with nature in a respectful way. Uh, you have to try to, to placate nature, uh, to placate nature the gods of nature and the elements out there uh, because they're big and scary and, and you, you can't control them. Uh, and so you have to do the best you can to work with them. All right. So some other examples. In Japan, the uh, uh, original uh, Japanese religion before Buddhism arrived, uh, before uh, um, other things, forms of Taoism uh, arrive from the mainland, the traditional uh, religious uh, approach of the original Japanese people, which eventually became kind of somewhat structured and codified and, and is referred to as Shinto, is a very nature-centric approach. Uh, not just a religion, but a culture and a way of life. And there's this belief in Shinto of kami, K-A-M-I, which means spirits, divine things. And um, practitioners of that approach have always believed that certain areas, certain geographic formations have kami attached to them more so than other places some places are more sacred have more spirits attached just by virtue of their power and those include waterfalls 
waterfalls and really tall trees are just a couple of examples now if you've heard the term kamikaze that means uh kami for divine and wind uh that's uh the the wind that came and swept away the chinese fleets that were trying to invade japan circa 12th century uh, so the divine protectors of the japanese islands similar to the concept of kami over in North America. Um, the uh, spiritual approaches of the indigenous people from, from here, the uh, Native American Indian people. Uh, for example, among the Lakota Sioux uh, from the Northern Plains, uh, there's the concept of Wakan, W-A-K-A-N, kind of similar, very similar to the Japanese concept of, of kami. It is, it can be translated as spirit. It can also be translated as mystery or mysterious. The Lakota term for the creator spirit is wakan tanka. Tanka means great, big, huge. So the great mystery is, uh, is how they view the creator. And they also believe that certain places are suffused with, with spiritual energy, certain natural places and landmarks, like this place, Bear Butte, uh, which uh, is in the Black Hills and is a very, very sacred place to the Lakota people and uh, even more so maybe to the Cheyenne, Bear Butte in, in particular. So... Uh, the, those, those cultures, their, their viewpoint, again, is that humans are not separate from nature. They're not apart from nature. Humans are part of the natural order and really have to cooperate with the other parts of nature, not try to dominate them. However, uh, among the Western civilization approach, the, uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition, it's quite different. Life is one long struggle against nature, which has to be dominated and has to be brought under control. And in a way, in a way, that's true on two levels. That's true on the physical level with actual geographic nature, the landscape, has to be struggled against and brought under control and put in order. And it also pertains to your inner nature, your spirit, uh, which also has a tendency to be wild and chaotic. And you have to struggle against that too, to bring it under control and make it orderly and paradisaic, not chaotic so there's there's different levels here all right well as more european cultures uh, european peoples uh, became sort of uh, incorporated into the uh, the values and perspectives of christendom and began to change their views of nature by the middle ages uh, we're talking about 8th, 9th century, um, certainly by the 10th century, there had been some huge changes, including some technological advances that farmers made in Europe, particularly in Northern Europe. Uh, and that included, okay, well, windmills is one thing. I don't have to explain what those are. Uh, that's just, it's really, uh, it's wind-powered devices that can um, can mill grain you know it can it can grind up grain so that you can turn it into flour and that is much more effective cost effective and time effective than the traditional way of doing that which was with a mortar and pestle basically take a rock and a stone bowl and just mash stuff up a little at a time so windmills enabled people to, uh, uh, to mill that grain much more effectively. Other things 
uh, that were, okay, these were not new in and of themselves. People had had plows for a very long time and harnesses for their animals. Otherwise, how are you going to get them attached to a plow? People had been plowing for a couple of thousand years at least, you know. Um, however, there were some huge innovations to plowing that were made in that, that time period, 8th, 9th century. First of all, um, let's think about how plows had worked traditionally, all the way back to biblical times. I mean, a plow was a wooden device with two poles, you know, for you to hold on to, and then you tie it to a horse or an ox or a pair of horses or oxen. Uh, and it's got like a little thing on the bottom that uh, scratches into the soil, right? And that's how you can uh, uh, turn the soil so you can plant seeds deeply or deeply enough. Now, those things were kind of light. They were made out of wood. And that was fine. That was fine for the very sandy soil of the Middle East and even the very sandy soil of the countries that bordered the Mediterranean Sea, Greece uh, and Italy and so forth. But the farther north you go in Europe, the wetter the climate is, the heavier the soil is. It's heavier, it's kind of sticky, and those wooden plows, um, which just scratched the surface, didn't do too much to that soil. And also, in order to make them work, uh, this is how people had always done it with those uh, uh, kind of light wooden plows is you'd have to plow a straight line, but that really is just scratching the dirt. It's not digging, digging real deeply. You have to plow that, plow your whole field, then go back and plow it again crossways, doing kind of a crosshatch effect, and that's what would loosen up the soil enough that you could plant. Okay, well, farmers in Northern Europe, in Scandinavia, developed a much heavier plow made of iron with, uh, you know, kind of a big, sharp iron blade. But in addition to that, uh, this little thing in front of the blade that turns the soil uh, in front of and behind it, that kind of like comes along and digs into that soil and, and turns it up. So what that means is that you can now plow these thick soils that previous plows wouldn't really touch. So that's more land available for planting. You can now do it in half of the time because you don't have to do it twice. You can just do it once. And that's where the harnesses come in. Um, you know, you, you have these things and you tie your horse or your ox to it and they kind of, they pull that, that plow um, and they have to strain because it constricts up against their throat, right? So the big innovation there was the introduction to Europeans of the horse collar, which is a padded, a padded thing that goes around the horse's neck that then the harness is attached to. And that was actually invented in China several hundred years before this. But by about the year 900, Europeans had uh, uh, been exposed to it. And particularly in Scandinavia, people started using it. Now, this is going to make a huge difference because the horses, before they'd been straining against uh, that harness and it had been choking them as they're trying to pull what's ahead of them, but now this thing is padded. It's padded, and so it doesn't choke them, and they're not having to pull and then constrict their throats. They're pushing against this padded collar, and the result is that then things get pulled. And by doing that, it utilizes the power of the horse. There's more horsepower. So that uh, a couple of horses uh, harnessed together with these special collars could wind up producing 50% more power than two oxen, even though oxen are stronger than horses. Okay? So more effective. And 
in addition to that, horses, they may not be as strong as oxen, but they have a lot more endurance. So by uh, hitching several horses instead of oxen to your now very heavy plow, uh, they can keep going. They can keep plowing for you know, two or three hours longer per day than oxen were able to do under the previous system. So what you're able to do now with the combination of the horse collar and the heavy plow is you can plow uh, faster because you don't have to do things twice, deeper, uh, you've got these horses that are producing more power and they can also, the horses can start moving faster and that adds more power. And they have more endurance than oxen so you can have more hours of the day. All that results in a lot of land that previously wasn't used for agriculture because they just couldn't, couldn't get it plowed. That's now available to grow stuff. And you can do it a lot more quickly than you could before. That means that you can use even more land because you have the time and the amount of hours in the day you have to work to do more, to turn more soil. And that really was revolutionary. And that led to a huge increase in agricultural input. So there you've got humans uh, definitely dominating the ground and the animals using technology uh, and producing more results. Uh, as a consequence of it. And uh, this, this is demonstrated in, in calendars. Calendars started to look different. They still had the same number of months, but before circa 830, um, the year 830, not, not the time of day, uh, before that, calendars, you, know, you had each month and you had like a picture, maybe a picture of a, of a tree with green leaves for three or four months, and then, you know, uh, with uh, with yellow and red leaves, then with no leaves, just to kind of demonstrate what time of year it is, what month it is. But these new illustrated calendars started showing up in the ninth century, in which each month was a picture of humans farming, dominating the nature around them. So no longer... Um, just uh, content to be a part of the landscape. Farmers before this, even in Europe, were subsistence farmers. That is to say that if they had a farm, they produced just enough to feed their families, to feed one family. But now, as all of these technological advances have enabled people to farm more and therefore produce more, then you've got people producing more more goods than they personally can consume. So what do you do when you have a bunch of extra stuff that you can't eat? Well, I guess you could give it away. Uh, that's, what, uh, that's what we've been doing at my house. We planted a garden, and there's way more stuff than we can eat. So uh, just give stuff away. But you know what's more likely to happen? Um, trade stuff. You know, I have a whole bunch of cucumbers. You have a whole bunch of tomatoes. I don't have that many tomatoes. Let's make some trade. And then the next step from there is to go to the farmer's market, right, and sell all that excess and bring in extra money. So this led to farming in Europe becoming much more of a business. And between the year 700 and the year 1300, the population of Europe tripled. Why did it triple? Because it was able to sustain more people. If it's able to sustain more people, then they'll make more people. Those people won't die uh, in infancy from starvation. You gradually get more and more people. Now, um, I have a, a note there to Alfred Crosby's Ecological Imperialism, very important book from the early 1970s. Crosby is the guy who uh, coined the phrase Columbian Exchange that you're probably familiar with in another book by him called Columbian Exchange. So, ecological imperialism. I'm going to be talking more about uh, Crosby's uh, ideas in there on that later on. Anyway, you got more surpluses, therefore that stimulates trade. 
and increased trade stimulates industry, and all this would eventually lead to the Age of Discovery by the uh, early 15th century in particular Europeans were venturing out onto the seas trying to gain access to distant markets why were they trying to do that well because they got extra stuff but also population triples although you know if you know your European history you know 1300 CE within a century or so there's going to be a uh, kind of a natural thing that's going to take that population down, the plague. Uh, but within a couple of hundred years, it's back up again. Uh, not only were uh, the population, not only was there overpopulation, but the land was being exhausted. You know, you can only farm the same things in the same soil so often. That's going to be another theme that we frequently examine in this particular class. Now, well, actually, this is probably a good spot. I've been talking for a solid half hour. Let's take a pause here. And when we uh, start the next lecture, we will be talking about how Europeans start trying to open new markets.